There are actually three of us. Uh, Roger Miller, our keyboard player, is out selling stuff, so he'd be more than happy to sell you almost anything you want out there. So uh, we're going to come out here and sit and talk for a little while. But feel free to go visit Roger, our Roger, and our Roger. So, yeah, we're going to sit? Yes. They're going to uh, be joined. Kristen, would you like to come out and introduce the panel, please? Come on out, we're, all, we're lonely without you guys. We know that you have, um, you'll still have time, those of you who've gone for uh, a potty break, you'll have a little time. We're just going to introduce and then come out and start the Q&A. And first, it looks like we have from Ebert Presents at the Movies, Ignati Vizhnevetsky. And back again, Michael Phillips from the Chicago Tribune. Well, thank you so much for that. That was fantastic. It was, uh... Our absolute pleasure. Thank you. Does anybody have any good jokes? Michael, you're a funny guy. You have jokes? <laughs> Why, don't, uh, Why don't we just do a little amongst ourselves and then we'll just do, I think we're just going to do about 10 minutes and then go to your questions and then we'll get on to the, uh, the, uh, the second half of this uh, incredible double bill that you could only get here in Champaign, Illinois. Um, I have to read one thing that David Bordwell wrote on, uh, on one of the most indispensable blogs uh, a, a cinephile can find, which is uh, curated so well by Kristen and David. Can you hear me now? All right. Speak up, for heaven's sake. Wow. I think I'm going to land a plane here or something. Um, here's what David Bordwell wrote after seeing this restored version in, uh, in, in uh, Hong Kong, I believe, wasn't it? Yes. Um, this version makes the strongest possible case for Fritz Lang's Metropolis. It is hard to dislike its shameless, preposterous ambitions, <laughs> its stew of biblical and modern ingredients, its bold architectural vistas, and its trance-like characterizations. Also, people running crazily about in gargantuan spaces can usually hold your interest. <laughs> and that, is, that really does strike me as one th thing that you can't deny, the, the, the delirious momentum of this thing. And this is what I love, and what I want to talk a little bit about to everybody about. What I love about the new footage, which paradoxically is the oldest footage we saw tonight, uh, it, especially when you get scenes like this, w when this 17 movie pile up that begins with a mad scientist story, you know, and, and, it's, and you can read it as any kind of allegory you like, and then it becomes a disaster picture and then a witch hunt. <laughs> but during the disaster, dis during the flood portion of the thing, that new footage really just moves like a river, and, it, and if without the missing footage, it just is not the same experience. I, I don't know if anyone here remembers seeing the Giorgio Moroder scored version that was theatrically released in the 80s. Um, and it's, it's very, very much a diminished uh, picture uh, that we are, we are so grateful to see now. And I know, Ignata, you said that you didn't, you, this really changed the game for you on this film. Well. You know, if <clears throat> Metropolis was, I, I think, 
it would have had to have been Metropolis, it was the first, first Fritz Lang movie I ever saw. And it was, uh, I actually saw it as a, as a kid. Uh, my dad went, uh, took me to see it as, as part of a program, which is also, I, I remember seeing Sherlock Jr. in the same program and uh, Dreyer's Passion of Joan of Arc. So it was kind of, you know, the, the cliche is that it's a formative experience, but it definitely was. And you know, if you would have asked me when I was like 10 years old what my favorite movie in the world was, I would have said Metropolis. Um, but as I got older and I got more and more into Lang's work, it seemed to kind of recede. You know, where at first it had been kind of the Fritz Lang movie for me. It kind of became the last movie I associated with Fritz Lang. And I would almost say that something like Moonfleet or, you know, An American Gorilla in the Philippines was more Lang to me than Metropolis. And I think it, it, it when I, you know, as I, as I kind of began to understand his work more and what he was doing more, it started to seem more and more like this was a Thea von Harbaugh movie, than a, who was his wife, who was the screenwriter, um, than a Fritz Lang movie. And then this version kind of came around. And it, 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 you're right, the, it's, it's all that kind of the chaos of that footage and all, of the, the, all the paranoia that's in the restored footage. And all of these sinister overtones, uh, or undertones, or they're really overtones, it's just really, really sinister. Kind of, it, it changes the movie. Um, before it seemed kind of like the simplest Lang, it just becomes this huge sprawling mess of evil deeds, you know, and all of these huge masses of bodies and, you know, just writhing chaos. Kristen, tell us now, af after, um, after Metropolis, uh, uh, Lang's wife became, um, I mean, a few years later, became a fervent member of the Nazi party, did she not? I believe she did. I, I really don't know too much about her subsequent career, but yes, they, they parted ways. Yeah, and Lang, Lang was very hard on his own achievement here. Uh, in interviews with Peter Bogdanovich and other people, he just dismissed it as politically naive, you know, almost inarguably. Um, but I, I think now that we have seen it nearly the way it was meant to be seen, um, we can certainly argue, and I, we hope to get a discussion going here, but. Uh, uh, it, it, it's not simply, it used to be dominated, as David mentioned in his blog entry, it used to be dominated, this film used to be dominated by this idea of the robot and that plot was primary in earlier versions of this film. And now, as you say, Ignati, it's, there's so much, there's so many kind of nutty doppelgangers going on in this film. And you finally understand what the thin man, this, you know, the spy, who's clearly the character closest to Long's own heart, I think, <laughs> uh, uh, is really up to, uh, the film becomes much more, at least, at least a more complex weave, I think. And, um, and, and we, we must get to the, the question of, uh, of the music in just a second, but you, you have something? Yeah, no, I just, I wanted to add, you said that, the, uh, you know, the, the, he said that the film was politically naive. I, I would say that earlier versions of the film seem politically naive because they are dominated also by the political narrative. But with this version, you know, I, I find it hard after it ends believing that everything is going to be all right. You know, it's the, the world he creates over the course of the film is so sinister um, that it, it just seems like it's not going to just disappear. It feels like, you know, bad things are going to continue happening regardless of whether they have this accord and this, you know, this hope at the end. Well, one thing that uh, one of the restorers said about it was that the older version is basically a sci-fi film, and this is not. It's certainly it's, it's a, a mix of genres in a way. But uh, I wanted to, to uh, ask you, gentlemen, you mentioned backstage that you had uh, scored this a number of times. Uh, how does it change in terms of genre for you, in terms of you know, seeing all this new material arising after you've already uh, dealt with it? Well, again, this is the... Uh fourth different version of this film that we've scored, the first one being the Marauder print 20 years ago. Uh, if you remember, it had the disco rock score with Freddie Mercury from Queen and Pat Benatar. And I know it by uh, heart, by the way. <laughs> so yeah, well, there was a film programmer in Boston who wanted to show that movie, but didn't quite think that really fit and had seen us uh, playing without films, and so that was how the marriage began. And we went into this whole thing of silent movies uh, very naively. We didn't, um, 
we didn't study how other people had done it. We just like, you know, went, went for it. And it's, it, you know, it seemed to work and we were pretty happy with it. And, you know, now it's 20 years later, we've done all these other films. And then we lost the, the rights to the Marauder print, the copyright ran out. And then we got the a print that was in the George Eastman house had, that was the Australian print. And it was vastly different. It was very, very religious. They cut out all the like near naked go-go dancing scenes. It was, all the titles were completely changed. So it was, it was like this really preachy downer. Uh, <laughs> Uh, and then the, the, the new restored version that came out shortly after that um, we did, and, and that was strange because there were so many of the blank titles. It was like they was a, made such a big deal about the blank titles. So it seemed like her herky-jerky and starting and stopping. And so with this one, yeah, it really, really comes together with the Thin Man character and all these other scenes that I hadn't seen in some of these other versions, you know, all the... Um, the shots of all the different eyeballs and all the different kind of crazy montage things. I thought it was just like beautiful and why weren't they in every other version? I don't know. But it was, uh, it really, really came together and the hardest thing was with each cut, all these different scenes are different lengths and in different orders and everybody had their own idea of it. So you play a film for 10 years, you kind of know what's going on and then that scene's not there anymore. So that's kind of the hardest thing to go. But with this one, it was so drastically different, and, and it was so complete. We did a lot of rescoring as well as just um, rearranging, and so it, it really took on a life of its own and became hopefully a, a real nice blend. And, and then, you know, it's probably in five years, somebody will find the rest of it, and we'll get another 20 minutes worth it. <laughs> yeah, it's funny. I mean, this, the statistics would have borne this out anyway, but while we were watching it tonight, they found another 45 minutes somewhere. Uh, two things about the Alloy Orchestra. I, that is, I don't think there's a better silent film uh, uh, extant that, that has the kind of mechanized overdrive necessity that is so perfect for what, you're, you, what you guys are up to. And, uh, and uh, I don't know about you, you folks, but I, I just really dig that crazy go-go beat in the nightclub scenes. <laughs> Did you, did you, uh, go ahead, that's, that, that was okay. your, uh, <coughs> sorry. You, we, do a, you do a mean fruit too, I hear. We, yeah. we wrote that go-go beat for a different performance about 22 years ago. We were struggling to get this together in a couple weeks when we first did it. It was, well, let's throw that, you know, boogaloo, we called it. And we always felt like, this is really inappropriate in this film, and we kept saying, Let's, let's ditch it. You know, next time we have a chance to rescore this or rework it, we'll just get rid of that. And every time we'd play it, somebody would come up to us and say, oh, I love that go-go beat, you know? <laughs> so it's there, and, you know, we had our opportunity to get rid of it again, and, you know, obviously it's back. So <laughs> when we first, when I first saw in, you know, one of the newspapers or some blog or something that they had found the complete version and there was going to be another half an hour you know, I, I just, my heart sank. I thought, oh my God. I mean, not only is it that much more work, but each subsequent version to us had gotten worse and worse. We thought that the, uh, the last version, you know, which had all those strange blank spots where they were explaining what was going on, it seemed too long and stretched, and I just thought, this is going to be a disaster when they get another, you know, 20 minutes into this. And we were so surprised when watching the film that it actually seems much shorter than the previous versions because it actually keeps you with the film throughout the whole thing. Yeah, I think since uh, we are running a bit late, we should uh, open it up for questions and comments from the audience. If there are people here with microphones for you to... Uh, yes. Center. Easy to spot, very helpful, red mic. Do we know what the music would have been that would have accompanied the movie originally? Um, I do. Uh, it's actually available on the uh, DVD and Blu-ray release. It was written by a composer named Gottfried Huppertz, who had been a friend of uh, Thea von Harbo, Fritz Lang's wife, and the screenwriter and novelist who wrote the book. Uh, he had <clears throat> done the score for Fritz Lang's previous uh, film, Die Nibelungen, and it had gone over very well. Um, so we asked him to do this one, and the score itself, you know, pe 
people go back and forth about it. A lot of people really like it. It's actually a, a competently written, very classical score in a so-called neo-romantic style. So it sounds more like Tchaikovsky than, you know, modern music. And Fritz Lang, actually in the Giorgio Moroder version, there's a um, introductory title card where they've just taken a quote of his where he says something about knowing nothing about music. And, you know, it's a little unfair to say that having chosen a neo-romantic score for Metropolis indicated his know-nothingness, but I think it's true, actually. So who would have chosen that for the first great science fiction film? When, you know, he could have had Schoenberg or Stravinsky or, you know, or, you know who knows who else, because this was, this was big business, and he could have invited anybody in the world to do this one. So. We know that there's footage missing. Do we still, do we know what's in that footage? Well, the inner titles that uh, were done in a different script were describing uh, what was missing. And I think the, it seemed like the longest thing that was missing was probably the fight between Rotvang and Faderson. Although the, the scene in the cathedral with the, uh, the monk or the, the priest uh, showing the book, the Whore of Babylon was also missing. Yeah, but I believe the, um, in order to, for, in a continuity sense, the, the fight with uh, uh, Frederson and Rotwang would ex explains how Maria is able to escape, which this is the closest, yeah, this version explains that closer than any of the others. It's like, okay, now she's back out. And it was always kind of harder, a lot harder in the other versions to um, differentiate between the robot Maria and the good Maria. And this one, it's very, very clear. And you know, I think explaining that and showing her actually escaping, you can really tell the difference. Uh, we have on the balcony up here. Here you go. Are the special are the special effects modern, or were they in the original? The special effects are original, and I should say that they are spectacular for their day. In the silent period, all special effects had to be done in the camera, which meant that. If you were going to do a superimposition, you had to wind back the film to the exact point you needed to start the second image. And none of this was done in the lab. None of this was, of course, done digitally. This is way, way before digital technology. So this is really incredible state-of-the-art special effects for 1927. But musically, it was just the three of us banging away. <laughs> Balcony. Yeah. Oh, we got a balcony. It yeah. said in the introduction. Oh, it's, it, it said in the introduction on the DVD that we were watching, or whatever, um, that after the premiere of the movie, the movie was severely altered and shortened. Um, like I've read somewhere that the original print of the movie is like over three and a half hours or something like that. Um, but why did they shorten the movie so much after its premiere? Well, I mean, I think it. They showed this thing once in, in Berlin for the premiere, and it was generally accepted that this movie was too long, didn't make any sense, the music was terrible, and that it should be re-edited and reworked. And it, so it's interesting that we've come back to this one now and we cherish this one as the great original. This was the one that was rejected, actually. But it's, it's still not uncommon for a film to be recut after its premiere. You know, films will, will often, after premiering at a festival, lose something like 10, 15 minutes. Uh, the difference is that nowadays people tend to keep those things around and not just, uh, you know, toss them into the waste bin. Right. You know, I was also going to mention that uh, we had an opportunity of uh, hearing the two Argentines who had discovered this and brought it to the attention of the world describe their whole process of how um, Pena, the guy, what was his name, was Jose Martin Pena, they all have very complex names. Um, was a film historian, had known about this for 20 years, and had been trying to get this little archive in Argentina to just allow him to go into the stacks and see if this was, in fact, what he thought it was, which was this original version. And nobody would take the trouble to let him into the, the archive until 
his former wife took over control of the museum. And she said, sure, you know, Martin, come on in and do it. And so the, the two of them kind of discovered that this had been just languishing in this archive forever. And they also explained that at the time of the premiere, when everybody else said, too long, doesn't make any sense, shorten it, um, an Argentine distributor said, no, this is perfect. I have to have this version. And he bought it on the spot, brought it back to Argentina, and that's why the only copy that exists of the full version is in Argentina, and it's expected they're not going to find another one. We've got time for just probably one or two more. Thanks. Um, so I bought a copy of these uh, three von Sternberg films from Criterion, and I was just delighted to hear your score on them. Uh, is there any likelihood we're going to be able to hear this score in a commercial version that we can purchase? This breaks my heart to tell you. We were actually commissioned by Kino to score this and have it be the alternate score on the DVD and Blu-ray. We, uh, well, not so fast. <laughs> we, uh, we recorded it. We uh, sent it into Kino. They started pressing, and then the German copyright holders, the Murnau Corporation, said, no, you can't, only, only the original score. So what we did, we had it all recorded anyway, and so if you really want to, and what we'd like you to do is buy our MP3 CD and the DVD, and with two gizmos, hook them up at the same time, and yeah, that's completely less than ideal, but yeah, it, it is heartbreaking, because again, after 20 years, we've been trying to match our music with any of these versions, and we haven't been able to, and then there it was, it was so close, and snatched out of our hands. Well, I'm afraid uh, that will have to be the last word. Uh, we're getting signs that we're running on a, way, on way a over. Sad note. Yeah. <laughs> but, thank you. Thanks very much. Okay.